Welcome to the Corrales Art Center's first salon of 2021 and happy new year to all of you. Today's topic, Theodore Roosevelt, Sportsman in Chief. I'm Kathleen McCleary and I'm coming to you via Zoom as you can see and we've been doing this for quite a while here at the Corrales Art Center and um, we hope that you're all doing well during this coronavirus pandemic. You are in for a treat today. I want you to imagine a president who has asthma, poor eyesight, and a heart condition, who becomes America's champion of fitness and athletics, and that's just the start. Historian and University of New Mexico professor Ryan Swanson is gonna take us back 100 years to an era that saw the birth of the World Series and the growth of high school sports. But before we get started, I wanna thank our sponsor, Nora Scherzinger of Corrales, for generously making today's presentation possible. I'll bet you all have been Zooming for months now. I know I have been, but I'm gonna offer you a few tips for today's event. And please know that if you have technical troubles, you will be able to see this later on the Corrales Art Center's YouTube channel. So let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll make it full screen and we will start here. You've probably noticed that we've turned off your camera and we've muted your microphone. And so we'd very much appreciate it if you'd keep it that way. Don't turn them back on yet. Um, all you need to know is that there needs to be a red line through those two icons. We want you to hide non-video participants. And what this means is you're not gonna see lots of little black boxes on your screen with um, names next to them. Instead, you're just gonna see Ryan Swanson and me. So I want you to click on the little carrot that's next to the camera and then click on video settings, then choose hide non-video participants and that will do it for you. It's really important for you to know how to ask questions today. So you're gonna, this is different from what we did in 2020. You're gonna have two options. You can write your question in the chat function as we've done before and a member of the salon committee, Sandy Farley, is gonna gather those questions and she'll pose them when it's the time. But we're also offering you the option, when it's time, not now please, but when we get to the Q&A, you can start your camera. Wave at me, actually physically wave your hand. I'll call on you and I'll tell you, you can unmute your microphone and then you can pose the question yourself. I wanna tell you a little bit about Ryan Swanson. He's an associate professor at the University of New Mexico in the Honors College. He's the director of the Lobo Scholars Program and he got his PhD in history from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. The book that we're talking about today is called The Strenuous Life, Theodore Roosevelt and the Making of the American Athlete. And it came out in 2019. But he also authored When Baseball Went White Reconstruction, Reconciliation, and Dreams of a National Pastime. Uh, that book in 2015 won the award from the Society, of American Base Society for American Baseball, their research award. Ryan has also published quite a bit in newspapers and magazines, and I put up a few headlines here and a few images, but everything from how we can make youth football safer to First Lady Melania Trump's tennis court. And there is a Teddy Roosevelt connection to that. So stay tuned for it. Um, I will stop the share and invite Ryan to come on screen. There he is. Ryan lives in Albuquerque with his wife, Rachel, and their three children and their dog. And welcome, Ryan, to the Corrales Art Center. Yeah, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Great. Well, I want to get started with a question. Um, and he's divided, by the way, his um, presentation into three parts today. Um, the first one, I want to start with a question that you posed at the beginning of your book. And you said, how did we get this way? So set the table for us by describing what you meant by that and what our nation was like at the turn of the 20th century. So you can take it away with your PowerPoint and I'll go away for a little bit here. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's, it's great to speak with you. Um, and I'm always excited to talk about Teddy Roosevelt uh, and sports. And um, I encourage any kind of questions you have either along the way in the chat function, which is kind of hard for me to see. So Kathleen will kind of call out if there's something in the middle um, or, or as we take kind of these breaks uh, as we go through the, the, 
um, hour that we have together. Um, any questions, um, I welcome. But what I'm going to do this afternoon or during our hour um, together is, is kind of tell you about two interrelated stories. I'm going to talk about Teddy Roosevelt, the athlete, and his odyssey as, an, as a kind of wannabe athlete. And then I'm going to talk about the rise of sports culture in the United States. And as Kathleen mentioned, I, I kind of frame the book um, around this idea of how did we get this way athletically? Um, how did we get to this point in American society where we do things um, like mix higher education and athletics? And for me, when I thought about this question, there was kind of two ways that I thought about it. There was a really personal kind of experience with this, how did we get this way question, and then more of a kind of academic way. So let me just give you a little bit of that so you can kind of um, maybe get a perspective on, on why I would write a book like this. On a personal perspective, um, I've got three kids. And so uh, my oldest is 15, my youngest is 10. And so over the past few years before the pandemic, we spent a lot of time at practices and games. Each of them have played different sports, um, inclu including in, in the Corrales Soccer League. And you know, in particular, I remember one really cold fall day when my oldest son was playing Little League Baseball and there was a you know kind of a crazy wind blowing in dust was everywhere it was you know in the 30s the kids were miserable the parents were miserable and i mean i just kind of remember stepping back and thinking what are we doing here uh, this seems crazy and yet it's very kind of normal american behavior to put your you know your kids in these kind of uh, situations so i mean there's a very personal component to uh, to this for me. But then, as I mentioned, there's kind of an academic side as well. You know, why do we at the University of New Mexico sponsor the Lobos in football and basketball and those kinds of things? Why do we assume that sports are good for our kids without necessarily demanding proof? Why do we organize our calendar, at least before the pandemic, around different kind of sports events? And, you know, Super Bowl Sunday, for example, is kind of a holiday um, in our culture. Why do we do crazy things like say we when we're talking about our favorite team? You know, I'm a, I'm a Lakers fan, for example, and sometimes I'll catch myself saying, oh, we had a tough night last night. I didn't have anything to do with that. All I did was watch the game on TV. Um, and so this is kind of the sports mania that I'm trying to figure out in this book. And what I found is in order to figure out when we got started on this track, you have to go back a little bit more than a century and you have to consider Theodore Roosevelt. Um, so let me, let me start there. And as I said, I'm going to talk about Roosevelt and this kind of emergence of sports. At the beginning of the 20th century in the United States, there are kind of two uh, important things happening. Um, on the one hand, urbanization has come to a tipping point. By the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, more than half of all Americans are living in urban environments. And this had been a pretty quick uptick um, there. And then in the working side of things, um, industrialization had really taken hold by this point as well. So people are doing very different kinds of jobs than say their grandfather, grandfather or grandmother had. And so there's this, there's this idea that the world has changed. The way that we live has changed. And very similar to kind of the way that we think of things today, there's angst about what this means. Should we be doing this kind of work? Is it good for our children? Um, kind of you know, what are we supposed to do? And in that context, sports becomes an answer to some of the questions that are rising. So let me kind of tell you, uh, you know, a few things that are, that are going on. In 1901, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president when William McKinley is assassinated. And one of the first things that Theodore Roosevelt does, one of his per first public events, is he travels, um, and you can see kind of on the left side there, he travels in 1901, November of 1901, to the Army-Navy football game in Philadelphia. He brings basically his whole cabinet to this event, and in doing so, um, you know, there's a real concern about him coming to this game. Um, Roosevelt becomes president via assassination. And for some Americans, they remember the assassination of Lincoln and Garfield and McKinley. And so there's real concern at this time that maybe America's democracy is falling apart. Maybe we can't do this. Maybe we're too unstable. And so Roosevelt travels to this Army Navy football game. He makes a loud entrance to the game. You know, at halftime, he kind of ceremoniously parades across the field um, so that, you know, he can be, you know, he's on the Navy for the first side and the Army for the second side. Um, and the press reports almost as much on the president attending this game as the actual game itself. They just can't get enough of it. They talk about how there's this new kind of president who thinks that sports are important and he himself is this kind of vigorous president who's out and about and doing things. And so when you look at Roosevelt's presidency, 
from 1901 until 1909, there's a number of significant developments in the world of sports. And just to be clear, I'm not saying that Roosevelt causes all these things, but what I am saying is that he helps us understand them. And in many cases, he kind of pushes them forward or at least gives kind of the culture um, a, a way to appreciate these things. So during his presidency, the first World Series takes place. That's one of the images you can see there. Um, also during his presidency, there's the rise of school-based sports. The PSAL is established in New York City in 1903. And this idea of, okay, we send our kids to school and we expect them maybe to be on the team and to be in a PE class, that's really started during this time. Also during this time, the United States hosts the Olympic Games for the first time. Uh, the picture on the right there is me with a couple of my students when we traveled to St. Louis um, to, to look at the facilities um, uh, regarding that first Olympic Games. Um, also during this time, the, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA comes. So there's this kind of super collider of developments during Roosevelt's presidency, which really carry us forward to today. A lot of the sports paradigm, the athletic paradigm that we think about today has roots in Roosevelt's era. Roosevelt himself experiences sports as an athlete and he's an athletic parent. So the, um, the young man in the middle here is Ted Jr. Ted Jr. played football at Harvard while Roosevelt was president. And so, you know, far from just being kind of this theoretical concept for Roosevelt, he's trying to be an athlete himself in middle age, which is tough and he's watching his kids compete. And so Ted plays football for Harvard and he experiences a whole rash of injuries. He breaks his ankle, breaks his collarbone, breaks his, uh, breaks his nose, he gets a laceration on his head. And so Roosevelt is, is kind of very connected to the, to the sports in that way. One interesting component to Roosevelt and this rising athletic culture is that Roosevelt has his own view on what sports should be. For Roosevelt, he thinks sports need to be utilitarian. And by that, I mean, he thinks sports should help Americans, um, whether they're children or adults, become better citizens. So in his mind, a sport needs to be suitably exhausting um, because that's gonna teach one endurance. He also thinks that sports should be physically violent. There should be some collision, there should be some exhaustion, there should be some toll that's um, paid. So because of that, one kind of interesting kind of counterpoint to Roosevelt encouraging all this sports development is he hates baseball. And um, I go into kind of significant detail uh, about this kind of counterpoint in the book, but to Roosevelt, baseball is not what the nation needs. Yes, he wants college football, he loves boxing, he loves tennis, he loves cross country racing, but baseball, not so much. Um, Roosevelt believes the game is too tied to money already in 1903. Um, and he sees that as being kind of effeminate. Um, he calls it mollycoddle, which is, kind of translated, uh, it's a game for wusses or something like that. So during Roosevelt's presidency, there's a really funny back and forth between him and professional baseball leadership. Uh, he's a very popular president. So um, the presidents of the American League, for example, in the minor leagues, try to get him to attend baseball games. You know, they want this popular president to sit in their stands. Maybe the newspaper men will take a picture. That'll be good for baseball. Um, but Roosevelt just won't have it. He, you know, he'll always kind of welcome baseball leaders to come visit him at the White House. He'll accept a couple of golden tickets. Um, so the uh, minor leagues, for example, gives Roosevelt a golden ticket, which allows him free entry into any baseball game in any city forever. Um, and he can bring any number of people with him. So there's just really hope that he's going to come to these games. Roosevelt, you know, accepts it. Great. You know, he's grateful for it. Never uses it. He does the same thing to the American League, accepts a golden ticket, thank you very much, never uses it. Um, so Roosevelt actually has kind of a funny back and forth with baseball. I call it a cold war. You know, he's never really actually hostile, um, but he doesn't think that baseball quite fits. So this is just kind of the beginnings here of, uh, you see a nation in change, cities rising up, people doing different kinds of work, and there's real concern about how do we operate in this society? And for Roosevelt and many others, sports becomes an answer. This is how we're gonna make the kind of citizens that we need going forward. Um, I'll toss it back to you, Kathleen. Yeah, um, so yeah. I guess we can assume, Ryan, that he never threw out the first pitch, huh? That's correct. Uh, he's not, you know, Taft after him will throw out the first pitch, but Roosevelt didn't, did never go inside of a ballpark. You know, in your book, uh, which I thought was fascinating, by the way, um, you speculate that there was another reason for why he hated baseball and it had to do with his eyesight. 
Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. I mean, again, I'm trying to kind of do two things in, in the book. Talk about how Roosevelt's own odyssey with athletics plays out and then this rise of sports in the whole country. And there's all these kind of interwoven things. But for Roosevelt, his chasing after athletic anything is really shaped by his own limitations. Um, he's asthmatic, which I'll talk about in a minute, but then he can't see very well, just practically um, speaking. Um, so Roosevelt will write several times in his diary, for example, that he fears nothing more than a baseball thrown his direction because he can't see very well. Um, and so I, I speculate, I, I kind of, um, you know, put out the idea that maybe for Roosevelt, it's kind of a a game which rubs him wrong because it really exposes his difficulty to even play catch with his own sons or something like that. So um, I think it's an idea to entertain. And maybe on a broader level, what it, it shows is that we are all shaped by our own weaknesses and we react to kind of movements within society, sometimes based on our own insecurities. And so I think that's, that's a bit of Roosevelt's concern with baseball. So that's a really good transition to uh, the next part of what you want to talk about is Roosevelt growing up because you've said he's sickly and scrawny and this is certainly not the picture that most of us have of Teddy Roosevelt. So I'll, yeah. I'll disappear for again and uh, let you take it over. Okay. So Theodore Roosevelt um, had his own odyssey and I think it's a really interesting, fun story that gives us maybe a little bit different um, picture of Roosevelt. Um, when I say Roosevelt to, for example, my teenage son, he thinks immediately of the night in the museum movies, which has Roosevelt kind of saying bully and charge, and he's just kind of this vigorous person. Um, but actually his story is, is, is different than that. Um, Theodore Roosevelt is born in 1858 in New York City. Um, you can see the brownstone there on the left that he is born in. Um, he's born at a time when the Civil War is on the horizon, but his own family is not all that affected by it. Um, he's, born, he's born into extreme privilege. Um, you know, his family has extensive holdings in the glass industry, the banking industry, um, and Roosevelt kind of has everything at his disposal for success. On top of his family's um, privileges, Roosevelt himself is, is very smart. He's precocious. He writes at an early age. He reads everything he can get his hands on. Um, he's got a real scientific mind. Uh, you know, there, his, his family travels to Africa and Europe. And during these travels, young Roosevelt, 10, 11 years old, will keep a journal. And I don't know what I would write in my journal when I was 11 years old, but Roosevelt took the chance to label everything he could with the scientific Latin names. And so his journal is filled with all these Latin terms. Um, so that's kind of the kid that he is, all kinds of ability intellectually. But beginning at about age three, Roosevelt suffers from a, from a crippling case of asthma. Um, it, is, it is kind of a crisis on a daily basis. You know, he'll have these, pa these panic attacks, these, crisis, or these asthma attacks. He won't be able to breathe. Um, a family doctor will be rushed in. And it gets so bad that Roosevelt is really confined to his, his home, uh, almost to his room for the most part. He cannot go to school. Uh, he's deemed to be too fragile. He certainly can't play any sports. He's not out there running around the park or anything like that. And what makes this even harder for Roosevelt is the fact that at this time in American history, the middle of the 19th century, asthma is understood as kind of half body and half mind, or even actually if we'll divide it in thirds, there's another part, character. So a child like Roosevelt who had asthma was kind of suspected of being lazy, maybe devious, and then weak. Uh, you know, what would be said is, oh, look at that kid. He's just trying to get out of going to school or he just doesn't want to go to church. And so that's kind of the view of asthma at this time. So you're, you're weak and you're, you're questionable in terms of your, your, um, your kind of ability to get things done. So the Roosevelt family has plenty of money. So they try everything they can to get him relief from this asthma. Um, they bring in all kinds of doctors. They have him ingest Ipecac. They have him bloodlet. Um, he's given shock therapy. They have young Roosevelt at about seven years old smoking cigars because the thought that was maybe, you know, the, the smoke would um, provide some relief. And, you know, they try everything, everything they can, but the, the medical um, expertise at the time just isn't very good. Ultimately, Roosevelt kind of decides that caffeine and coffee is, is really what gives him any relief. And so he becomes a coffee drinker at a really young age. This is really a terrible thing for Roosevelt and the whole family. This rich, wealthy family with all these abilities and, and places to go is really held captive by this, these crises that happen. So finally at age 13, and this is kind of where we start to connect back to athletics. 
At age 13, Roosevelt's father calls him, he's a big bear of a man, calls his son into his study in this pretty luxurious uh, Manhattan home. And he tells Roosevelt he's had enough. The family's had enough. He basically says, enough with this asthma. You need to solve this problem. And the way Roosevelt remembers it, he'll write this down, as will his sister. The father says to him, you have the mind, but you have to make your body. And as a father, you know, I look at this as kind of unfair. Basically, this 13-year-old kid is being told to solve his own asthma problem. Roosevelt sees this as a key moment in his life. He looks at his father. He thinks to himself. He kind of rolls his head back, according to his sister's memory. And he says, okay, I'll do it. I'll make my body. And if this were a movie, here is where you would kind of cue the Rocky soundtrack in the background. So at this point, Roosevelt starts going to the gym every day. In fact, his father builds him a gymnasium on the kind of back patio of their, uh, of their home. He gets a boxing instructor. He starts pounding the bag, lifting weights, doing everything he can. And gradually, there is some progress. Um, uh, at about age 14 and a half, Roosevelt is entered into a boxing tournament in this gym that he's training in. Long story short, most of the competitors drop out except for a couple of really weak boxers, and Roosevelt wins a trophy. And for the rest of his life, he will talk about this pewter trophy as one of his greatest, most prized possessions, because it's kind of this sign that, okay, even though it was a really you know, shallow pool, at least I can kind of get in there and, and, and do my thing. And so through athletics and through sports, something pretty miraculous happens to Roosevelt. His asthma goes away. Now, what we know medically today is it's actually pretty common for um, adolescents to age out of the worst effects of asthma. And that's what happens. But in Roosevelt's mind, it's crystal clear. Hmm, what happened? I had asthma and I got in the gym and I, and I exercised and I lifted weights and I pound the heavy bag and my asthma went away. And for Roosevelt, this connection, work hard athletically, cure yourself of weakness, that connection will be linked in his mind forever. So when he becomes president, he'll look at the nation and citizens and kind of think, okay, all we got to do is get vigorous. We got to get out there. We have to exercise and we can kind of solve some of our problems. Just a couple of uh, further notes on, on this point. Um, Roosevelt <laughs> has a very scientific mind. And so as he takes on this challenge of bettering himself athletically, he keeps statistics and notes about everything. Um, you could call it self-absorbed, I think, I, or at least I would. Um, but here I put on the left here uh, something from his journal, uh, 19 or 1875. Just He's about 17 years old. He's at this point taking measurements of himself all the time. You know, is my chest getting any bigger? Have I put on any weight? He really wants to grow taller, but, you know, five foot eight is about where he maxes out. Um, but this is his approach to it. And so, again, tying it back kind of to the bigger picture, Roosevelt sees athletics as a way to move forward, whether for himself or the nation as a whole. Roosevelt does go off to Harvard University. Um, and by the time he gets to Harvard, Roosevelt has become a decent athlete. Nothing spectacular, but at the very least, he can go into the gymnasium, and that's what the building is there on your right. And he can, you know, he can pound away. He can be part of the group. He wins some, he loses some in his sparring exhibitions, but um, Roosevelt has kind of made himself into somebody who can compete. And if we, uh, Actually, I'm not going to talk much about this, but another part of this kind of going forward is Roosevelt does obviously serve in the Spanish-American War. I'm sure many of you know the Rough Rider story, um, but Roosevelt sees that as kind of part of his experience as well. And so lastly, in this section here, by the time Roosevelt gets to the White House, he you know, just continues to think that in order to get better individually or collectively, we have to challenge ourselves. And so for Roosevelt, actually, that plays out really in two sports primarily. He will box for most of his life. Um, he'll spar, as you can see, kind of from a, a magazine depiction there on the left. But as much as anything, Roosevelt loves tennis. And so um, Kathleen mentioned at the beginning there that I wrote a piece kind of talking about Melania Trump's um, leadership kind of uh, renovating the White House tennis complex and how that has ties back to Roosevelt. Well, um, you can see here in this image, and I know it's a bit grainy, but when Roosevelt moves into the White House in 1901, he oversees a massive renovation. And in that renovation, a, a tennis court is put in right outside of his window there. It's basically where the West Wing is today. But the windows that you see in the picture there, kind of on the face of the building, that's Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt's office. And the cement that you can see just kind of past that little section of lawn, that's the tennis court. 
And so Roosevelt quite literally has a tennis court three or four feet from his desk as president. And this will become a really important cultural touchstone for the nation because they will hear about these matches that, that Roosevelt plays. And so Roosevelt will play tennis hundreds of times during his time as president with all sorts of people. And Roosevelt views tennis as something more akin to, you know, kind of war than art. He loves to play in August. And for those of you who, you know, have, are familiar with Washington, D.C. in August, it's not really a great time to do anything outside. But Roosevelt would get out there and he would get whatever visiting dig dignitary was in the, in the area. He'd invite them, come to the White House. And then they'd show up the White House and he would say, uh, you know, are you at all familiar with tennis? And if he got any sort of positive response, he'd say, perfect, here's a racket, let's go play a match. And they'd head out and, and play in the August heat or in the January freezing cold. And over the course of his time in the White House, Roosevelt developed what becomes the tennis cabinet. And these are 35 or so young government men and leaders who are kind of his regular um, playing partners and advisors. And what this does is it gives Roosevelt some physical exercise, yes, but it really begins to kind of, or it further connects politics and American life and athletics in a way which is sanctioned by this really important president. So there's all kinds of great stories about Roosevelt on the White House tennis court. Um, but let me pause there again. I can go on on these things forever and, and kind of toss it back to you, Kathleen, as we as we think about this part. Absolutely. In fact, I thought the tennis was one of the most interesting parts of your book. Um, you say there are no photographs of uh, Teddy Roosevelt playing tennis. Why not? Roosevelt's really concerned about balancing the line of image and exercise. And so for Roosevelt, he's very, he's okay. You want to take my picture riding a horse? He's all about it. In fact, he will sometimes look through proofs and say, can we get this a little bit better in terms of horse riding or something like that? Um, but he's concerned that tennis is a little bit too country club. We think today it's a little bit too kind of for the rich. Maybe it's a bit effeminate, he will say at times. And so he'll make sure that that's really kind of left on his own. So there's no, um, no good images of him playing tennis, but the stories certainly leak out about it. Um, but he wants to kind of guard that. And, Rose, and you know, famously, Roosevelt will say, you know, definitely not, or I won't take any pictures playing tennis, but certainly not golf. That's fatal. Um, and so, you know, a couple of times I've, you know, joked about Roosevelt's advice for Trump might have been, don't let him take, you, you know, take pictures of you playing golf because he saw that as a real problem. So image matters uh, then as now. So country club, though, I mean, certainly in terms of what he wore or how he served the ball, he didn't look like a country club tennis player, right? No, Roosevelt's very much wanting to, to get kind of the most out of every uh, exercise experience. So he often will wear kind of an army type outfit, you know, this really thick canvas jacket, um, you know, thick trousers. Sometimes he'll get out there in his kind of work boots and he'll play tennis in that and he will just sweat profusely. Um, and, you know, he's got a really direct style of play. So he's not a great tennis player. Uh, in fact, he'll serve the ball kind of the same way. He just kind of holds the ball up in front of him and just gives this kind of direct pound, to, you know, across, um, across the court. But uh, I think where Roosevelt gets the most joy out of tennis is not in his skill. He certainly doesn't necessarily kind of, kind of dress in tennis whites or anything like that, but he loves the camaraderie and he loves the, the kind of fatigue that will come with a tennis match. Um, you know, very different from what he's doing, say, at his desk in a given day. So that tennis cabinet, those um, government folks who played with him, how much influence did they actually have? And did any other president have sort of a similar kind of unofficial cabinet? I, you know, I think not really. Um, so again, it's a, it's a big group. There's about 35, but there's a, there's a handful of more important um, individuals. Um, Jules Jusharam, for example, who's the ambassador from France is one of this cabinet. And the cabinet gets really close access to Roosevelt. Um, they come and play. And so for example, uh, one of his tennis cabinet um, kind of the members of the group talks about the day that he was out playing with Roosevelt and Roosevelt just kind of casually mentions, oh, I won the Nobel prize. And this is kind of how he got news. So with this athletic um, engagement with the president, there was access. And s some uh, scholars have made an argument that um, Robert Bacon, for example, gets preferential treatment because he was always willing. Whenever Roosevelt said, are you interested? Bacon just said, yes, I'm in. So if it was a hike or a walk or a tennis match, and I would tend to think that it would be similar today if the president asked you know, a government worker, do you want to meet me on the links? Or do you want to play? You know, you, proximity matters. And so 
Um, this becomes Roosevelt's kind of unofficial cabinet. And I, I, I think maybe a comparison can be made. Um, President Obama gets a somewhat regular basketball game going during his presidency. And there's some camaraderie that comes there. It pulls from different people uh, throughout the um, kind of government during his time. So that, that maybe would be the closest example. Um, and just to, you know, one thing that that does is it, it's kind of a closed good old boys situation uh, for Roosevelt and Obama and these, you know, it's all men. And so um, with proximity and opportunity for some, you're certainly leaving others out as well. Absolutely. Um, a reminder to our um, members who are watching, if you have questions, please start putting them in the chat function if you want us to read them or jot them down so you remember them when it comes time for the Q&A. Um, turning to the title of your book, uh, The Strenuous Life, you know, it's a word that uh, most of us don't use very often in 2021, but it was a pretty common word in uh, 1902. So um, tell us a little bit more about Roosevelt's strenuous life, both in the White House and afterwards, and I'm going to disappear again for a little bit. If there's a word that is used by Roosevelt and to summarize Roosevelt um, during his time as president, it is strenuous. And strangely, uh, as I was doing my research, there's all these derivations of strenuous, which are not actually words. So strenuosity and strenuousness and strenuously, and, they, and some of which are actual words and some are not. But um, I did find during my research in 1902, for example, more than 10,000 references in the press using strenuous to describe Roosevelt. So they would say he's a strenuous eater or he has great strenuosity in his politics and kind of strenuous became this word that um, was used by Roosevelt and to describe Roosevelt. And the roots of that connection um, go back to the time before he was president. So if you think just briefly about the timeline I've laid out, you know, you've got an asthmatic child who comes to, you know, pretty, pretty strong health by the time he's at Harvard. And then he holds a series of government offices, um, you know, assistant secretary of the Navy, for example. Then he goes off and serves in the Spanish-American War. He comes back and he's elected as governor of the state of New York. And it's while he's governor of the state of New York in 1899, before he becomes VP, that he's asked to give a speech in Chicago. And so he goes to Chicago on a cold uh, April day in 1899, and he gives a speech which essentially deals with imperialism and conquest and foreign policy. And it really is about the US um, role in the Philippines. But during that speech, uh, Roosevelt, uh, which becomes known as the strenuous life speech, he lays out this idea of the strenuous life. And you can see the quote there. Uh, this is a life of toil and effort of labor and strife. And Roosevelt puts this idea out there in 1899. And once he does so, you know, he ceases to have control of it, but he kind of becomes most strongly associated with it. To live strenuously means to dare financially. It means to test yourself physically. It means to go for um, kind of the, the victory um, militarily. And it's used to all kinds of things, but for Roosevelt, it really becomes tied to the physical or the strenuous life becomes really tied to a physical athletic life. And so Roosevelt, as he's giving support to the rise of the Olympic games and the NCAA and college football, he'll start to talk about the strenuous life as something which um, oftentimes includes those athletic sports. And so kind of the background to the strenuous life is that Roosevelt you know, he has a bloodlust, um, certainly. Uh, Roosevelt says several times during his life and during his presidency that he thinks it really would be best for the U.S. and its citizenry if they were involved in a war at least every generation. Because to him, it's this kind of purifying experience that makes, you know, good men better. It kind of kills off the weak and it, and it reconfirms the U.S. experiment. And so without a war to fight, Roosevelt thinks that's a problem, but maybe college football or maybe boxing can kind of serve as an alternate. Um, certainly not baseball, uh, as I've already meant, uh, mentioned. So Roosevelt, uh, for example, will throw his weight behind the development of high school sports. He'll say, you know, that's part of the strenuous life. That's a way that we can encourage the development of our citizenry. Um, perhaps most pragmatically, during Roosevelt's time as president and after, in which he remains really um, squarely in the public eye, Roosevelt's version of the strenuous life in athletics um, really becomes dominated by his belief in what he calls point-to-point -point hikes. 
So Roosevelt will, um, when he's president, he'll have the Secret Service drop him off, you know, four or five, eight, nine, ten miles away from the White House, usually with a friend or with a compatriot of some sort. And his goal will be to walk back to the White House in as straight a line as possible. And this is kind of a crazy idea, but his point is I'm going to go over the boulder, through the pond, you know, straight line back. Um, and there's a couple of uh, kind of famous examples of this, but let me just briefly kind of tell you how this plays out sometimes. So, for example, um, one spring afternoon in May, Roosevelt invited a couple of his favorite members of the tennis cabinet. Um, Jusserand, who you can see there, he's the ambassador from France, and Robert Bacon, who is the assistant secretary of state at the time. And so he has his Secret Service, um, which is actually a very new organization, by the way. After McKinley's assassination, there's this belief we have to do something better to protect our president, but Congress is still really fighting about how that's going to play out. He has his Secret Service drive him out on the Potomac River and drop him off, and he and his fellow um, strenuous lifers uh, go to work hiking along the Potomac River. And what's great about this experience is Jusserand and Bacon both write about the experience in really funny detail. And so what they talk about is they're, you know, the president leading the charge up ahead. He's always talking about what a bully time it is and how delightful it is to be out. Meanwhile, they're kind of scrambling to keep up. Um, they're going up and over the kind of granite edifices along the side of the Potomac River. Everybody's getting sweaty. Jusserand at one point talks about how he, uh, Roosevelt would always kind of say to him, put on your worst, you know, your worst clothes and we'll go for a hike. And Jusserand will say, I have no worst clothes left. They've all been used up. So, you know, they're kind of falling and scraping. Roosevelt's having a great idea, a great time. And so, you know, about midway through the hike, um, they're back down the banks and they're right along the Potomac River. And Roosevelt says, despite the fact it's May and the sun is going down, it's getting cooler, we should all take a dip. Let's, you know, let's jump in the Potomac River. And Jusserand by this point knew what to say whenever Roosevelt said something crazy that they should do. An excellent idea, he would say. And so you've got the ambassador from France and the president of the United States and the assist assistant secretary of state. They all strip off all their clothes, um, get naked and wade into the Potomac River together um, to kind of balance this strenuous hiking and heat that they've raised and they get in the cold icy waters of the Potomac River. So they're all standing there naked. You can imagine the picture that some press could have taken if had they'd come across. And one kind of additional funny detail that happens, uh, Jusserand, for some reason, hadn't taken off his gloves yet. And uh, Bacon calls over to Jusserand saying, you should take your gloves off if you're going in. And Jusserand answers back jokingly, no, what if we meet the ladies? You know, so he's going to keep his, his gloves on in, in kind of good uh, gentlemanly fashion. And they get their clothes back on, and then they make the long hike back, and then they're picked up by the Secret Service. And after this is over, um, Roosevelt will tell the story in great detail, including the skinny dipping. Jusserand is a little bit more circumspect. He won't. But these kind of stories happen all the time with Roosevelt. And the press gets wind of them, and they begin to kind of further, or they really, um, they really further connect Roosevelt to this idea of the strenuous life. Before this time, it's rather amazing to imagine your president getting out there, getting dirty, going in the river, hiking for 10 miles, going to a college football game. And so Roosevelt really sets a new idea for what it means to be strenuous, what it means to be um, an American at this turn of the century period. And just kind of as a last um, you know, bit of information here, one of the, my favorite parts of Roosevelt's story actually was, was how he kept up this chase after the strenuous life for his entire life. So Roosevelt leaves the presidency as a relatively young man in 1909. He tries to run, for, he does run for president again in 1912 as a third party candidate, doesn't win. And by 1917, you have Roosevelt, 58 years old, um, World War I is starting and he wants nothing more than to raise his own regiment and go back to war. That of course is a crazy idea. The United States is not gonna send an out of shape overweight 58-year-old uh, over to, to Europe for what will be a brutal war. But so, you know, Roosevelt's kind of trying to figure out what it means to continue to, to live vigorously as, a, as, you know, in his late 50s. And so um, he goes off to, to a, a training camp. Uh, there's a boxer, Jack Cooper, who has opened a fitness camp. And so the former president of the United States signs himself up and goes away for two weeks. 
And for two weeks, he gets up first thing in the morning and runs four miles. And then he does weights and then a sparring session and then the medicine ball. And then he gets a massage and he does a cold water plunge. And for two weeks, the former president um, kind of goes after this. And by the end of his time there, the press can't wait to get access. And so Roosevelt um, and his handler or his secret service kind of allow the press to come in for his final day at Jack Cooper's farm. And in typical Roosevelt fashion, he not only talks about how vigorous it's been, he talks about how he lost 14 pounds. He also kind of somehow turns the entire thing into a race. And so with the press kind of surrounding him and the mayor of New York City, who's come out to visit as well, um, he says, let me show you my favorite trail that I've been running for these two weeks. And so this whole gaggle of people head off with Roosevelt in front and gradually he starts walking faster and then he starts jogging and then he just starts running and people are trying to keep up with him. And so he huffs and puffs all the way around this mile or so trail and comes in first and he views it as a victory and everybody else was like, wait, was that a race or not? But this is kind of indicative of Roosevelt, even at 58, um, continuing this, this kind of competitive, strenuous lifestyle. Um, he will die shortly thereafter. He dies at age 60. And I think one of the reasons we think of Roosevelt as so strenuous now is we never knew him really at a time when he really was, was past that strenuous age. We didn't see him age um, over a duration of time. Rather, he died relatively young. And so that kind of shapes the way that we think about him. And the last thing I'll say is just that this idea of the strenuous life continues to have legs even today. Um, this is Miley Cyrus, who, uh, for those of us who aren't myself included, you know, really up on the, the popular culture of the day. She's an actress and a singer of some sort. She had the strenuous life um, tattooed on her arm. If you're interested, you can sign up for the strenuous life uh, kind of fitness program. You can see the, the emblem there in the middle. A uh, company has made a business out of this. And Roosevelt's words, um, I didn't talk about the man in the arena speech, which some of you might remember. It's kind of standard fare now for locker rooms and schools. Um, and so this quest for the strenuous life, which Roosevelt personified more than a century ago, helped us emerge as a nation athletically. And it still is very much kind of shaping the conversation today. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because like I said, I can go on forever. So I'm just for the record opting out of the strenuous life fitness <laughs> program. <laughs> yeah. I will say that the, the story about uh, skinny dipping in the Potomac had me laughing out loud. But it <laughs> also raised some questions for me. And by the way, I think there were, you named the two other people, but there was also a general with him and two others. So it was, it was right. a, a group of five or six people. Yes, um, yes. I wondered, you know, where was the press corps? Where was the White House press corps? And where was the Secret Service, given what you just laid out about the assassination of McKinley making him president? I would think they would want eyes on him all the time. The, the Secret Service was in its infancy, and so they were still kind of trying to figure things out. So it's difficult to piece together. There aren't, there aren't great records, but from what I can tell on that particular hike, for example, the Secret Service viewed it appropriate to transport the president and the group. As you said, it was bigger than just the three that I mentioned. He, you know, They viewed it as sufficient to transport the group to the beginning of the hike, um, to kind of spread out then you know, in the area that they thought the president was going after the fact, and then hope that he showed up at about the time when he said he was going. That was a case where he wasn't going all the way back to the White House. They showed up. So that was deemed sufficient by the, the Secret Service. So um, nothing like the kind of commandeering of any space that the president is in now. Um, regarding the press, there was just a very different understanding of the relationship between the press and politicians. So Roosevelt had several instances where the press would, would kind of encounter him in an athletic situation. And he simply said, not now. Um, this is time for me and my friends. We're exercising. Please don't. And they didn't, um, which is rather shocking uh, today. And I've come across a number of um, instances as well where, uh, you know, at, uh, Roosevelt does a lot of this hiking in Rock Creek Park, which for those of you that know Washington, D.C. a little bit, is really right there in the middle of the area. And so there were a number of times where Roosevelt would be out um, hiking in Rock Creek Park or scaling some of the, the granite rock faces that used to be there before they were quarried out. And, you know, a group of hikers would come along and say, oh, there's the president. But in every instance I could find, if Roosevelt simply said, you know, he would greet people kindly and politely and then simply ask for some space and they would give it to him. So um, there was a very different relationship uh, between the president and security, the press and the people than what we have now. So um, it seemed, seemed to work for the time.
Yeah, a really different era. I think I'm going to ask you to stop your screen share so that um, yep. we can see the chat function. If people have questions, please do put them in. Um, Sandy Farley, go ahead. I was just really curious about uh, football. It, did you have any thoughts or um, interest in football? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sandy. Um, in 1905, uh, so Roosevelt just gets reelected as president. In 1905, uh, football has arguably its worst year. Um, it's, there's a little bit of debate over the number, but either 18 or 19 or 20 college football players die on the field due directly to football injuries. And so college football has a real crisis at that point somewhat analogous perhaps to what we've heard kind of talked about over the past decade with concussions or CTE or something like that. And there's a, a significant movement in 1905 to shut down college football altogether. The idea is why are higher education institutions involved with this lethal game? Let's shut it down. And the leader of that abolition movement, if you will, uh, was the president of Harvard um, at the time. And Harvard was not only the Harvard that it is still today in terms of its kind of position in American society, but it was also one of the best football playing universities, very different than today. So, I mean, if you kind of think of Harvard as still its intellectual heft, but also roughly the University of Alabama or Clemson or something in terms of football saying, no more, this is no good, um, it's too dangerous, uh, we should abolish the game altogether. That's what's going on in 1905. And Roosevelt is pulled into this debate by, uh, he's, a, he's a Harvard grad himself, he's pulled into the debate and Roosevelt will hold a, a summit of coaches um, from Yale, Harvard and Princeton to try to iron out some new rules to make football violent. Roosevelt still wants it to be violent. He's fine with people getting hurt like his own son, but not deadly. And so Roosevelt will help facilitate a conversation that leads to football making some changes um, you know, uh, they stop some of these mass momentum plays and something like that. The game becomes just a bit safer and kind of is, is saved from this crisis. And so the NCAA today, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, gives one of its highest awards called the Theo Theodore Roosevelt Award. And they claim him as the kind of founder of college athletics. I think that's not entirely accurate, but Roosevelt loves football. He wanted all of his sons to play football. He attends numerous college football games during his presidency and before and after. Um, and so he sees football as a suitable substitute for war, he will say. And he thinks the teamwork and the violence create better men. And so um, he plays a role in kind of protecting uh, football from being uh, kind of ridded from the nation as a whole. So I invite others, of course, to put your questions in the chat function or just do what Sandy just did, start your camera and I'll recognize you and you can ask a question. I'm curious about the public schools um, piece of this, Ryan, because I think in your book, you talked about how this didn't just lead to the growth of sports and leagues and all of that, but gave some uh, opportunities to black athletes and women athletes. So talk about that a little bit. I think you could argue that the establishment of the Public Schools Athletic League in 1903 is as revolutionary as anything that happens. Because if we, perhaps if we all think back to our time in elementary and high school, you had, we all had some experiences with physical education classes. For those of us of a certain age, we went through the pres presidential fitness testing um, system, which for some of us created really bad memories, maybe for others, good memories. Um, but this idea that we should link together our education system with our sports system was, was put in place. And so the PSAL is established in 1903 in New York City and immediately is copied across the nation. Initially, as, as you're, you're saying, Kathleen, it was primarily, the target was always male and there was certainly a bias as well. Um, New York City public schools, for example, were just formally, officially desegregating, um, you know, kind of as this is going on. But fortunately, there are some uh, reformers and leaders that come along right after the establishment of the, the Public Schools Athletic League in 1903. Only a couple of years later, um, a, a branch is established to encourage girls' participation. And so we start to see, um, and there's a huge demand. Uh, and it's kind of funny that when they first established this, the, the girls' chapter of the PSAL, there's some concern that maybe nobody will show up, but at the very first meeting, there's uh, hundreds of girls, and then there's a New York City-wide gathering, and thousands of people show up. So immediately, there's interest um, from not only girls but support from their parents, which at the time was unsure whether this would, you know, parents would they think this is okay for their daughters to do? Um, 
And it, you know, it's never, it's never equal. And I would argue it's not equal today in terms of opportunities for males and females through school sports. Um, but that establishment does happen. And if you're looking for a place where there's a progressive idea about gender equality or racial equality, um, you could argue that the schools are usually more tipped towards creating equal opportunities than say the professional, you know, professional baseball or, or even the Olympic uh, organizations or something like that. So uh, that, that is important. I don't want to leave the impression though that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a great uh, civil rights leader. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Roosevelt is a man of his time. Um, he, you know, the way I describe it in the book, I think that the way I would summarize Roosevelt is he believed in equality on kind of a face-to-face -face basis. If he met you or I or a person of color or somebody different than him, he would give them all courtesy and respect individually, but he did not spend much of his time at all concerned with creating legislation or systematic equality. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're smart to point that out. And Roosevelt is criticized, rightly so, by some scholars as uh, a warmonger, uh, a racist, a misogynist, and there are, there are components of his legacy and personality which, which force us to confront those things. You know, when you talked about uh, the difference in the eras in terms of the press and the Secret Service, it also made me think a little bit about what we've witnessed in the last uh, week in at the Capitol. And I'm wondering what you think Teddy Roosevelt might have thought about what's happened. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that and I've been asked by a few uh, different outlets, you know, for kind of a, a thought about that. And so let me preface this by saying, here's my, here's my guess. <laughs> you know, um, I think Roosevelt would have called in the infantry, called in the Marines, called in the army when anybody breached the Capitol. Uh, Roosevelt had an intense belief in kind of the sanctity of American democracy and governmental spaces and decorum. And so I think Roosevelt would have called in, called in the troops and told them to shoot you know, on site if somebody was breaking into the Capitol um, because he would have seen that as just going far beyond any sort of discourse or protest. Um, and beyond that, you know, I think uh, Roosevelt was a leader who was very comfortable confronting members of his own party or members even uh, that were kind of generally aligned with them uh, when he thought that they went too far. And so he never had this idea, well, I shouldn't say never, he was very comfortable with the idea that he was going to have supporters who he agreed with most of the time, but not all of the time, and they needed to be called out when he disagreed with them. So uh, I think for, for TR, for example, if there were a group of TR fans who, you know, created some sort of protest that, that, that incited violence or that led to property destruction, um, he would, it would be very in character for him to say, you know, that's way too far and, and to call that out. And um, so I think his he had a very nuanced understanding of who he was loyal to, who his political opponents were. And maybe we see that too, you know, he, he runs for president in 1912 against the Republican party. And so he was always, you know, kind of comfortable with, um, breaking those partisan lines that today seem so clear. I think we have a question in the chat function. Uh, Sandy Farley, do you wanna come on and read that one? There you are. Hi, I'm, why don't you read it, Kate? I, I don't have that on my screen. Oh, sorry, I will go ahead then. Uh, so this is a question from Janie and Jerry Dussault. And uh, Jerry writes, am I totally misremembering or confusing this, but didn't he go up the Amazon River with his son for a strenuous trip? Absolutely, you are not, not misremembering at all. Um, there was a, a great book actually uh, about the River of Doubt excursion. And so after Roosevelt leaves the White House, uh, he's really at a loss of, of what to do with his life. Um, and so he spends about a year or, no, excuse me, a couple of months uh, in New York City uh, before then embarking on this trip to South America through the Amazon, then Europe, then Africa. And so, yes, uh, that's a great, you know, a, a great point to make that that too is part of this uh, strenuous way of living. You know, to, there were dangers, understood dangers before he left about, um, you know, going down the Amazon River. And indeed, that journey almost kills him. Uh, he loses, you know, he he gets dysentery and a couple of other, you know, issues, medical issues that arise, and he never fully recovers. You know, as I mentioned, he passes away in 1919 um, at 60 years old, and um, he's never quite the same from that trip, but it fits for him. So he takes this trip with his son, 
And, you know, he just does it in, in the fashion that only he could. He takes about 20 books with him because he knows he's going to want to read while he's on this trip. You know, um, he takes, you know, he writes as he's on it. He just revels in the heat and humidity and bugs. He loves the snakes that he sees, you know. So, yes, I think that um, that that adventure is very much part of this strenuous life as well. And it's one that almost kills him. Um, but that I think and he says after the fact that it was worth it regardless. The um, idea of being outside and doing these uh, strenuous activities is something that certainly appeals to a lot of New Mexicans. I mean, we hike, we enjoy the mountains and so on. So I know this isn't something you really touch on in your book, but talk to us just a little bit about Teddy Roosevelt's environmental legacy. Yeah, Roosevelt, uh, and I, you're right, I don't spend much time on it in the book because it's such an important additional uh, topic that I, I felt like I couldn't do it justice. And so I kind of tried to stick to this idea of athletics and, and how that went there. Um, but Roosevelt is, he doesn't found the public and uh, national parks, as some people say, but he plays a really important role in using executive powers to broadly expand the national park system. And Roosevelt has a version of, of conservation which tries to um, maximize the use of land, to set aside land, but he doesn't believe it should kind of just be left untouched um, and preserved forever without kind of being used by humans. So in my mind, he's, he's pretty effective at balancing those things. He has a, a lifelong friendship with um, John Muir, um, Gifford Pinchot, uh, who uh, is director of the foreign, uh, forestry, is, is one of his friends as well. And so he sees um, the wide open spaces of nature and the West as really important. Um, uh, you know, Roosevelt, uh, just uh, one other thing I'll add on this. Uh, as a young man, Roosevelt's first wife dies in childbirth on the same day that his mother passes away. And Roosevelt is grief stricken. And the way that he handles that grief is he leaves the New York State Assembly, which where he was serving at the time, he hated it, actually he said nothing was getting done. And he leaves for a year that he spends in North Dakota. And on the kind of barren landscape of North Dakota, he goes through a brutal winter and, you know, just talks about how the being outside around cattle in the outdoors um, is really restorative to him. And so he, he counts that as one of the signature kind of experiences of his life. Um, and incidentally, Roosevelt has a love for the Southwest. Um, when he's raising his Rough Rider Regiment for the Spanish-American War, he basically wants two kinds of people. He wants college athletes, he'll say, so he has a bunch of college athletes, and he wants people from the Southwest because he thinks they're more rugged and, and robust. And so, um, you know, as is indicated by the Rough Rider Museum in Las Vegas, for example, uh, Roosevelt had a real respect for our people in, in New Mexico, you could argue. So I have just one other question for you, Ryan, and that is, um, as a biographer, after you've done all this research and you pulled it together in a book, do you love the guy or do you hate him? <laughs> I love him, uh, you know, I, and I can provide more nuance there. I certainly see his foibles and his his problems, but uh, in writing a biography, you kind of Roosevelt wrote more than a hundred thousand letters, uh, and so you read his writing. And I didn't read every one of those, but I probably glanced over every one. And I know I talked with my own kids. My kids know a lot about Teddy Roosevelt, and now we need to cover all the rest of the presidents um, because he just really became part of our dinner table discussion. I would say, oh, here's what I found today, and. Um, I will say Roosevelt's letters to his own children are amazing in their, um, their breadth and their passion. He'll write to his kids, for example, when they're off at boarding school or off at college, and he will talk, he'll bring up Greek philosophy. He'll say, you know, here's what, here's what happened among the Greeks, and then he'll transition and talk about the public policy, and then he'll draw them some, some pictures on the bottom of, of the hunt that he just went on, and then he'll always sign off, you know, love, love from daddy, um, and he's president of the United States during that time, and so I always think, man, this guy was doing it all and writing his kids these amazing letters. So uh, he's an amazing, he's an amazing engine, an amazing passion, um, which I think is is really convicting. And so his idea of the strenuous life certainly was fodder for discussion in our household and continues to be, despite the fact that he was, you know, far from perfect. So um, I came away liking him all the more. Well, your passion certainly shows in your book. Um, before we end, I want to uh, thank the Salon Committee, my colleagues, Sandra Ben, Pamina Deutsch, Sandy Farley, Barbara Mark, Charlene Spiegel, and Sue Winstead, because uh, it really does take a village to put one of these together. And another shout out to Nora Scherzinger for sponsoring today's Salon. 
And believe me, we are all anxiously awaiting the day when we can gather in person again, but we're grateful that you could join us via Zoom and feel free to send the link. We're gonna give it to you later on how you can see this on the Corrales Art Center's YouTube channel. Um, we do have a full docket of salons ready to go this year. And next up is cookbook author, Jane Boutel. She's going to explore the culinary history of the Rio Grande Valley. And that's Friday evening, March 12th. So please look for an invitation in your email and check out the website for a complete list of the 2021 salons. And of course, if you enjoyed today's presentation, uh, tell your friends about the Corrales Art Center. So um, thank you again to Ryan Swanson for sharing your insights and your terrific stories about Teddy Roosevelt and the growth of sports in America. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yep. And thanks to all of you for watching. <laughs>